Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I need to vent for a minute. This morning I woke up. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but um, I woke up and looked at my alarm clock. I was kind of whining a little bit to PT when I first came in. I woke up and I looked at my alarm clock. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I looked at my alarm clock and it was 10 minutes before my alarm was set to go off. That made me so mad. Has that ever happened to you? Or you I mean, it's like, come on, really? Another 10 minutes and the alarm would have went off. And I, just, I was just frustrated. <laughs> like, all morning I was walking around, I was trying to get my head right, I was trying to get my spirit right, but I just couldn't shake this whole thing. I woke up for like 10 minutes, really? Like before the alarm went off, and I ended up hitting the snooze another couple times even after that. None of this has anything to do with the message today. I'm literally just venting right now. <laughs> just warming up the engine. All right. That to say, I couldn't get my head right though, and, and I know when I come into step seven, I gotta be right. right. And I wasn't quite right until I pulled into the parking lot and I saw that little black Tacoma pickup truck. And if you don't know, you probably do, that's PT's truck. And when I saw that truck, I was like, yep, it's going to be the best day ever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that, uh, Lord, I just invite you into this, this space. Lord, I invite you into this moment. Lord, I ask and beg that you would take over this room. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, you would open up my heart. Open up my mind. Help me be present, Lord. Help me to, um, to relay your words. Help me to be a vessel to just, uh, to just deliver what you have for your people, Lord. This is your message and not mine. So, Lord, I pray that you would open up everyone's minds and, and ears and their hearts to receive your word today. And I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all know me, I like to get real. It was November 2016. To be specific, it was November 18th, 2016. I walked out of the Douglas County Courthouse. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. It was a sunny day, but it felt dark. Like right when I walked out of the building, just by, by happenstance, there happened to be a bunch of other people that walked out of the building like at the same time. So I was surrounded by people, but I felt lonely and isolated and cut off. If I had to put a word to how I felt that morning, I would, I would say I felt forsaken. See, I was a believer. Not only that, but I was serving God. I was speaking and preaching and I was helping people and I had overcome my own addictions and it turned that into a ministry and all those things. But when I walked out of that courthouse that day, I had a piece of paper in my hand. It was a dissolution of marriage. It was a divorce decree. And over 12 years before that, I had promised myself that I would never walk out of another courtroom with another piece of paper like that again. But here I was in a deep pit, just feeling lonely, miserable, and dark. I felt forsaken. The word forsaken is an adjective. It describes something. The definition of forsaken is to feel abandoned or deserted. I wonder if anyone here has ever felt abandoned. I wonder if anyone here has maybe had a, a, a parent leave out of your life. Maybe your father left you and left you feeling abandoned. I wonder if anyone here has ever felt deserted. I wonder if anyone here has ever been in a, in a situation where you, you, you were in maybe a deep relationship with someone and you had all of your chips in the table. You look down at your hand, you had a pair of kings and a pair of queens, and you thought you had a pretty good hand. Till they dropped their cards and they had a royal flush. And you watched all of their chips go to the other side of the table, as maybe somebody walked out of your life and threw up the peace sign and said, I'm out of here, this ain't working out. 
I wonder if anyone has ever felt abandoned or deserted. You walked into a place of employment. After years of service, they have them tap you on the shoulder and say, your services are no longer required around here. Here's your last, pay your last paycheck in a cardboard box to walk out of the room with. I wonder if anyone here can relate. And I recognize that this message may not be for everyone. I recognize that someone here might say, I have no idea what you're talking about, and I have never experienced that at all. But the message for today, I'm entitling this message, Forsaken. Because I wonder if someone can relate to that at all. The message I have for you today, it's very simple. The opposite of forsaken is courageous. The opposite of forsaken is courageous. Now this is important because forsaken is a feeling and that feeling could be nothing further from the truth. But when you feel forsaken, you have to reach down to a place inside of you of courage and you have to latch onto that. And you have to live out the feeling of being courageous in that moment to just get through it. Now if you've ever felt forsaken, if you feel forsaken, or if you ever in the future feel forsaken, understand that you're not alone. Now, if you live long enough, someone will walk out of your life. And if you believe long enough, you'll have a day or two where you feel like if you can just get real, where sometimes you'll just question life. Sometimes you'll question even your faith. Sometimes you'll find yourself serving God and living for God. But you'll find circumstances come together where it's just so dark. And you're lonely and you're isolated. You might even be surrounded by people such that you step back and you even question your relationship with God and say, um, God, maybe you've never had this conversation, but I have. God, I thought I was a child of yours. God, I thought you had a plan for my life. God, I thought your plan was for hope and a future. I thought your plan was to prosper me and not harm me. God, I thought your plan was for good and not evil in my life. But God, I can tell you right now, it feels like I'm a little forsaken. And so when you feel like that, understand that you're not alone. You're not on an island. You're not the only one to feel that way. As a matter of fact, that feeling of being forsaken is not even something that's, that's brand new. That's not a 2019 kind of thing. The feeling of being forsaken goes all the way back to the Bible days, probably even before that. As a matter of fact, there's one chapter in the Bible where you can see forsaken story after forsaken story after forsaken story after forsaken story, all in one chapter of the Bible. Grab a Bible and turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 5. The book of Mark. Chapter 5. Mark is on the right side of the Bible. Second book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. You turn to chapter 5. While you're turning there, let me set it up for you a little bit. At the end of chapter 4, Jesus and the disciples were in a boat. Matter of fact, there was multiple boats. They were in, the, in, in a boat, multiple boats in the Sea of Galilee. A storm came up, a vicious storm, and it just tossed and, and turned all of the boats such that the winds and the waves were just crazy. And the water started to get inside the boat and swamp the boats. The disciples were freaking out. Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat on a cushion. You ever felt like in your life things were going crazy? You're freaking out, but Jesus is asleep at the wheel? Or am I the only one? Maybe I'm the only one. You're right. This is a live crowd. Okay, I got one. I got one. And so this is a lesson for us that sometimes when these storms come in, the breakthrough or a breakthrough, many breakthroughs are right behind them because storm clouds are never stationary. So we find ourselves at the beginning of chapter 5. At the beginning of chapter 5, it reads in verse 1, they went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. Your Bible might say Gadarenes. It's the same area. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one can bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Verse 5. 
Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. I'm going to stop right there, but read that again. Verse 5. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. This man was living in darkness. Now, in today's language, or at least where I'm from, we might say this man was cray-cray. This man had more issues than Kleenex has tissues. He had significant problems. He lived in darkness. It said he lived among the tombs. Have you ever lived among dead things? <clears throat> Have you ever lived among dead relationships, dead friends, dead circumstances, dead substances, dead habits? Have you ever lived? Have you ever been alive but not quite living? This man was living a dark, dark existence. And he was alone, isolated, and cut off. But he was in a crowd. It said that people came and they tried to bind him over and over again. They, 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 they hooked his feet and his hands together with chains. And if we were to get real in this room, some of y'all in this room know what it's like to have your chains hooking your hands and feet together. If you keep straight forward, nobody will know I'm talking to you. This man was bound. This man was, he was living in a dark existence. He was lonely and isolated and cut off. This man was forsaken until he met Jesus. Amen. Suddenly, everything changed. What turned out to be a conversation between this man and Jesus actually turned into a conversation between Jesus and the impure spirit that was inside of this man. Not only was this man in a crowd on the outside, he had a crowd on the inside. This impure spirit identified himself as legion. He said, for we are many. And the conversation turned into the, the impure spirit actually asking Jesus not to be cast out of the area. So Jesus gave this impure spirit permission to go into a herd of pigs. The herd of pigs, 2,000 of them, ran into the ocean and killed themselves. Again, this man was living in darkness. He was lonely. He was isolated and cut off, but he was surrounded in a crowd. He was forsaken. Until he met Jesus, and then all of a sudden, a man that was forsaken one minute is now freer than he's ever been free the next minute. And as we continue to read, he's so free that he actually asked Jesus if he could go with Jesus. And Jesus said, no, I need you to go back to where you came from, to where you live, and tell them all about what, what's happened to you. This man that one minute was forsaken, he's so free that this becomes the first evangelist that we read about in the Bible. And he was good at his job because the very next time we see Jesus going to his hometown, they all know who Jesus is. Jesus took this man instantly from being forsaken to being free. I feel like the guy in the late night commercial. But wait, there's more. The chapter's not even over. If we continue reading, as a matter of fact, skip down to verse 21. It said, when Jesus had crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was at the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her suit so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. We come across, we hear about this little girl. This little girl, as we project the story forward, this little girl turns out she was 12 years old. And she was sick her entire life. So sick that she's now on her deathbed. This little girl that we hear about is living in physical darkness in her life. All she's known was sickness and illness. And now as we read the story forward, if we were to keep reading, we find out that now she's on her deathbed and she's actually surrounded by people. She's living in darkness. She's isolated and cut off in her circumstances, but she's surrounded by people. This little girl is forsaken. But what we have the benefit of knowing that she didn't know was that Jesus was on the way. So her dad is leading Jesus now amongst this crowd to his house. But then a woman steps in. A woman steps into this scene. Skip down a few more verses. 
to verse 25. And a woman, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt, her, she felt in her body that she was freed from suffering. Stop right there. This woman steps in, this woman is living what we call a, the issue of blood. She had been bleeding for 12 years, 12 years of hemorrhaging. Based on Levitical law, she was considered unclean, which meant she had to announce her presence whenever she's around other people that she was unclean, unclean, unclean. As a matter of fact, she wasn't even by Levitical law allowed to touch other people or they would be considered unclean. This woman's life, her existence, she was an outcast. She lived in some level of darkness. She lived in isolation. She lived in solitude, but wait a minute, she is around a group of people. This woman knows what it's like to be forsaken. But in this moment, there's this man that comes along, this man that she heard of, this man named Jesus. And even though there's a crowd, even though she's supposed to announce her presence, even though she's not supposed to touch everybody, the laws, all of the protocols and customs went completely out of the window. And this lady just figured, if I can just reach in, if I can just reach in through this crowd, and if I can just reach out and touch him, that's all I need. And so I would imagine if I could picture in my mind her just getting down and just maybe elbowing some knees out of the way and just getting her hand in and just trying to reach, just trying to reach and trying to reach until she eventually touches just the edge of his cloak. She touches the hem of his garment and it says her bleeding stopped immediately. And immediately she felt her healing in her body. But she wasn't the only one to feel. Because it said that Jesus stopped. It said that Jesus stopped because he felt power leave out of his body. Another translation said that he stopped because he felt virtue leave out of his body when she touched him. And in that moment, Jesus turned around. Jesus turned around and looked and began to ask, who touched me? His disciples looked around at this crowd like, Jesus, what are you talking about? Who touched you? Do you see this crowd? How can you say who touched you? This is a different kind of touch. Because see, sometimes we as believers can, we can get trapped and locked in the logic of, man, if I can just pray, if I can just pray, if I can just pray, maybe God will just come to me. I submit to you that sometimes when we get done praying and we say, amen, we got to get up and we got to do something. Sometimes we got to reach out to God. And this woman know that, knew that, and she touched him, and when she touched him, something came out of him that was, that was evident to him. He turned around and asked and looked, and when this woman surfaced, he looked at her and said, daughter, which is the only time he called a woman daughter, he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Boom. Boom. Look at Jim. This woman went from being forsaken to being free, to being healed, just like that, just from a touch. We've heard about a man in the tombs, forsaken and free, from demons. We see a little girl who's sick, and we know that very shortly she's going to be healed from death. And here we see a woman that was forsaken, that's now free, and she's healed from disease. But wait a minute. What about Jairus? <clears throat> What about Jairus, the synagogue leader? Of these other three people that I just named, he's the only one that's actually named by name. In this chapter, we see the demonic man. If you read, maybe the heading in your Bible says a demon-possessed man or the demonic man. The little girl is Jairus' daughter. This woman is just the woman, and we call her the woman with the issue of blood. But Jairus, he's a man of significance. He's a man of importance. He is the, 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 the leader of the local synagogue. People know who he is. And lest I remind you that Jesus is not on the fantasy team of the synagogue leaders at the time. I'm pretty sure that Jairus didn't walk through the crowd with a baseball cap and a hoodie on. People knew who he was when he went to the feet of Jesus begging and pleading for Jesus to come save his daughter. 
Jairus was dark. He was living in darkness for the sense of his daughter, emotional darkness. I have three daughters. If any one of my daughters was sick, I would lay everything to the side to get to whatever the healing is that they need. Jairus put his position, he put his reputation, he put his street cred to the side because he was forsaken. He was lonely in the middle of a crowd, but he went to the solution. And what began as a journey of Jairus leading Jesus now turns into a, 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 a kind of an upside down scenario where all of a sudden Jairus looks behind him and Jesus is not there. Jesus is back having a conversation with the woman. Jesus is now talking with this woman and Jairus is like, um, excuse me, if I was Jairus, I would say, um, I'm the one that kind of put everything on the line here. I have a daughter that needs your help. She's dying. What are you doing talking to this woman? Here's where we need to be careful about who we surround ourselves with. Because when you surround yourself with people that don't know Jesus, they will try to put a period where God has a comma. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 35. It said, while Jesus was still speaking, some of the people from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, came and they said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? When you surround yourself with people that don't know Jesus, they'll try to throw dirt on problems that aren't solved yet. It ain't over until God says it's over. I remember the first day that PT called me that afternoon and told me about this diagnosis. And he's sitting right here. He will tell you that the first response I had to him was, PT, I'm looking forward to the party where that same doctor is going to tell you you are completely healed. Amen. We need to have people around us that's going to tell us what we need to hear from God's perspective. We can't put dirt on it until it's over yet. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to, I'm going to speak boldly here. I don't want to hear anyone in this room volunteering to host a pity party for PT going forward. <laughs> PT doesn't, and I'm saying this while he's sitting right here. He doesn't need anybody coming up, shuffling up, oh PT, I'm so sorry for you, I'm so sorry for you. We need to look at this man and we need to say, you are blessed, you are strong, you are forgiven, you are healthy, you are free, you are gifted, you are empowered to prosper, you are loved by God, you are redeemed by Christ, you're a friend of God, and you are going to see a miracle happen in your life. Oh. That's how we are to be living. So as the captain turns on the fasten seatbelts and we begin to our initial descent, if I were you, ask, I would be asking, what is in this for me? That's a great question. What is in it for you is the understanding that Jesus loves you enough to meet you right where you are. But Jesus loves you too much to leave you right where you are. Because Jesus understands. He understands. He's been there. He understands that feeling. He understands what it's like to be lonely and isolated and dark. If you were to turn to the book of Mark chapter 15 and 33, it would tell you that as Jesus hung on the cross, the skies got dark. It would tell you that Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My Lord, my Lord, why have you in me. You see, Jesus knew what it was like to experience the darkness. But wait a minute. Wasn't, isn't Jesus part of the Trinity? Isn't he God in human form? Yeah, but on the cross, he became you and me. And he hung there. He hung there surrounded by a crowd in darkness, living in the loneliness and the isolation that is forsaken. Jesus wasn't the only one crucified that day. Jesus wasn't the only one to carry his cross that day. Jesus was not the only one to be put on trial that day. Jesus knows what it's like to take that journey. Jesus knows what it's like to be in darkness. He knows what it's like to live in loneliness and isolation. He knows what it's like to have such deep darkness in your life that you can even question your relationship with God the Father. So as we finish this morning, and as I close, 
Let me remind you of the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 31.6. Moses says, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. There will be times in life where you'll feel abandoned. There will be times in life where you'll feel deserted. There will be times in life where you will feel forsaken. I can assure you, though you may feel forsaken, you are never and will never be forgotten. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, uh, we bring today to you, Lord, we bring this word to you. Lord, we just pray that you would, uh, you would grow it inside of us, Lord, allow it to plant like a seed and allow it to grow, Heavenly Father. Allow it to grow and be life-giving to us and to our lives, Lord. Allow us to leave here different than, than the way we came in, Lord. We thank you for today. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and to worship. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to share your word, Lord, and to hear inspiration from you, Lord. And we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that you would multiply it in our hearts, multiply it in our spirits, and multiply it in our lives. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.